Well, good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the Friendship Sunday School class of Tap Methodist Church here in New Boston, Texas. Uh, my name is Tim Graham, and we're going to be in lesson number four this week, and uh, it's called Living Without Fear is the, uh, is the lesson that we're in, and this one is uh, Replace Your Fears with Submission. And we're going to be reading out of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And it's only fitting that we're going to be reading uh, about the announcement of the birth of Jesus to Mary here in the Advent season. So perfect timing. Uh, a few things before we get started this morning. Uh, prayers for the marriage of Aaron and Mackenzie uh, Harmon that happened last night. I'd like to wish them uh, a long and happy marriage. It certainly is a joyous occasion uh, when we get to, uh, to come together for a wedding and got to visit with an old friend last night, uh, Coach Buddy Ray. And that's literally and figuratively, because <laughs> we've been friends for a long time. But uh, but it was really good to sit down uh, with him and, and visit with him uh, and find out how things are going in he and Sherry's life. Uh, keep on your prayer list. Uh, uh, Kim Taylor and Maggie Snyder, as they're still looking uh, for a kidney transplant, uh, please pray for the people that are on the road and traveling. Uh, this weekend, uh, a lot of college and high, a lot of college graduations uh, were going on. We were able to go Friday and see Natalie Goodwin graduate with honors uh, from the Mays Business School, and that was a pretty exciting time for David, Melanie, and Katie and their family uh, as they got together. And a few of my classmates, uh, Michael Sproba saw his daughter graduate, and Curtis Wales saw his daughter Therese graduate, and Dickie Putts uh, saw his son graduate. So it was really a Exciting time for those graduates and their families that uh, that a phase in their life is coming to an end and uh, another one's fixing to kick up. If you know of someone that we need to pray for, you, you can list it here in the comment section. Uh, but no worries, those are like I say, just some of the things that, uh, that we need to pray for today. If you've got your Bibles handy, turn with me to Luke uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, well, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we uh, come this uh, last morning before Christmas and this Advent season, uh, we come before you with requests uh, for healing, uh, requests for peace, requests for marriage success that uh, all these prayers that we've lifted up this morning concerning the individuals and uh, these new college graduates as they prepare for a new way of life, that you would continue to be involved in their lives, that you would continue to bless them and offer them peace and guidance and wisdom. And Lord, as we pour over your word this morning and your angel's announcement to Mary, we would ask that we step back and take a look at what she gave up to where she could serve your purpose, where she could fulfill your prophecies. And Lord, sometimes that we uh, submit to our own fears rather than your will. And Lord, give us the courage and the freedom to know that you've only got our best interests at heart and, 
and we're here to serve a purpose for you. And then when you call us, we're to be the obedient, just like Mary was, that here I am, Lord, use me. Lord, all these things we'll ask in your name, amen. As, uh, as we read over these words this morning and this announcement to Mary, it comes in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And I, I don't know if, it, uh, if Mary knew before that time that Elizabeth was pregnant with John, but she certainly leaves very quickly thereafter to go visit her and uh, talk with her about the, uh, what has happened, the appearance of the angel before her as well. <clears throat> because the same angel, Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and to Elizabeth and uh, well actually it appeared to Zechariah first and Zechariah had his doubts because <clears throat> uh, he and Elizabeth were had been married a little bit longer they were a little bit further along in age and he just could not believe that uh, that he and Elizabeth were fixing to bear a child uh, because he had been barren all these years but when the angel appeared to him in the Holy of Holies <clears throat> and he questioned this the angel uh, shut his mouth, <clears throat> wouldn't let him talk. Uh, he told him what the name of the boy would be. Uh, he told him that uh, all the things that were concerning him, that he would uh, pave the way for the Savior. And Zechariah still doubted, but he silenced him. And he could not speak until John was born. But Mary took on a little bit different approach. She was, she was going to sacrifice a lot of things. Her, her relationship with Joseph, uh, with her parents, with the Nazarene community, would never be the same when she accepted this charge. But she was familiar enough with the Bible. She was familiar enough with the prophets and the prophecies of Jesus that she realized what an important role that she was playing. So instead of being fearful that she would be rejected by society or fearful of all the, all the things that would happen to her, she was willing to put all that aside to fulfill what God's will for her. The best estimate of Nazareth's population at the time of this announcement had to be more, no more than 400 people. So it was really kind of an insignificant uh, portion of the country. It wasn't in a big city. Uh, it, it wasn't to a well-to-do family. <clears throat> the location was humble and obscure. It was contrary to expectation. You know, the most astonishing and world-altering event in human history was fixing to happen, not in a great city or a region of power, but in the obscure and humble locations of Nazareth and Bethlehem. And this is really kind of interesting uh, when we look at this, uh, because in, in today's society, we think that the thought processes and, and all the great ideas come from the big cities, and that's simply not true today any more than it was back then when the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary. Because as long as there's people that are willing and able to serve God's purpose, he's still going to continue to use them. He doesn't care where they come from. And this is another testament to God using his miraculous powers to bring about uh, the Savior of the world through an obscure and and remote location like this uh, through a poor, poor girl in uh, one of the most despised regions of Israel. The English version of, uh, or the English standard version of the Bible describes Mary and Joseph's relationship as being betrothed. So it, it uh, Luke makes a point here of telling the, the reader of the story that Mary was engaged to Joseph. She had already uh, been betrothed to him, and this is a very important part of the story because her civil status as betrothed signifies that she and Joseph had already entered into a formal marriage covenant. They were going to get married. They had already decided this between the two of them, so both of them knew. Luke identified her first as a virgin, <clears throat> meaning that she had never had sexual relations with a man, who was engaged to a man named Joseph. He tells everybody this story uh, to, to set up the situation to make known what's fixing to happen. So not only is Mary involved, Joseph is involved. Uh, you know, Mary couldn't have been more than, than probably 12 to 16 years old, somewhere in there. 
And uh, it was a big deal to get married. It was a big deal to get married to a pure woman. And so the angel of the Lord appears to Mary, and she's familiar enough with Scripture. She knows what's going on, but she really doesn't understand the how. And she asked the angel, how is this going to happen for me to come pregnant uh, with, the, with the Son of God? And, uh, and the angel explains to her how it's, how it's going to happen. And Mary accepts that. Mary might have been uh, innocent. She might have been pure. Uh, but she wasn't naive. Uh, she knew how babies came about. She knew that it was a consummation of marriage. She knew that sex would be the thing that would plant the seed to, to, uh, to, to, to make a new baby. And she just was kind of confused about what the angel was telling her into how she was going to become pregnant. And that's really about the only thing that she was concerned with. And once the angel explained what was going to happen, Mary said, I'm fine with that. Let's go ahead. You know, Joseph, on the other hand, was a little more hesitant. Okay. Because when the angel of the Lord appeared to him, he had already set up his mind, made up his mind that he was going to kind of divorce her quietly. That he didn't want to put her to shame. He didn't want to put him himself to shame. He didn't want to put his family in that predicament because he and Mary both knew what they had done and had not done. And that would be kind of tough to convince the outside world that here these, this humble couple uh, out of Nazareth is going to conceive and bear the son of Christ. You know, that, that probably wouldn't have been well received in the, the major metropolitan cities because they can't believe that something so important to human history would occur, uh, occur and set up such an obscure town. And what about the, what about Joseph's family? What about Mary's family? Would they tend to think that Joseph and Mary didn't remain pure? Because by their own account, by the fact that Mary asked the question, how's this going to happen, leads everybody else to know that they know how it happens too. So Joseph has already made up his mind that he's going to kind of divorce her quietly, but that's not what God wants. He wants them to remain engaged. He wants them to get married. But the first thing that's going to happen is this, the Immaculate Conception. And y'all need to understand what an important part in history that y'all are playing. And Joseph really wasn't as convinced as Mary was. He had to have an angel come and visit him in a dream to tell him, don't do this. What you concocted on your own is not what God has got in store. And I, and, I, and I imagine that Mary probably felt a little bit more comfortable with the angel visiting her because the angel pays, pays her lots of compliments. Grace to you, favored one. Mary's reaction was not fear, but thoughtful questioning. She kept pondering what kind of salutation this was, trying to think about the importance of the words, mulling them over, what the angel's saying to her. And then the angel follows that with a, do not be afraid. God has found a favor with you in many ways. And this is what you're fixing to do. Is it accurate to say that Mary doubted? Or how would you evaluate Mary's faith? It appears in this story that she's not really doubting uh, the fact that what's going to happen. She's just kind of curious as to how it's going to happen. Because the questions are going to come. Well, Mary, I, I thought you and Joseph were engaged. We are. Have you and Joseph had sex? No, we, we haven't had sex yet. Yeah. Well, how is it that you're pregnant? Well, the Holy Spirit came over me, and I'm going to bear the Son of God. I'm going to bear Jesus. That's what I'm to call him when he's born. Mary <clears throat> immediately accepts a message and asks, how can this be? And she shows by her response is that a whole experience that includes intellect. Hey, I know how this happens and I know what people in the community are going to say. So you need to give me a pretty good explanation of what's going to take place. Modern people tend to think that uh, read ancient texts with an arrogant attitude as if people in former times weren't always as smart as we are now. We assume that people back then were superstitious and ready to believe anything that, they, that other people claim. But of course people were not less intelligent 2,000 years ago. Mary responded much as you would respond if an angel showed up and started talking to you. 
you probably wouldn't, you, you'd probably be in awe that the angel was there in the first place, but you would probably ask questions uh, during the conversation, after the conversation, after the statement, because you wanted to know why. You wanted to know how, because that's the way people are. They want to be informed, and Mary was no different. But the barriers she faced against belief in the Christmas message were very every bit as big as the barriers we may be facing today. But yet a combination of evidence and experience shattered those barriers, and she came to faith. And this is where we get into the fact that Mary was familiar with Scripture. Now, she wouldn't have been familiar with Scripture because she was reading it. She would have been familiar with Scripture because she was hearing it. And she knew what the prophets of old had foretold. She knew what was fixing to happen because she had been to temple. She had heard the scriptures read. So she was familiar with this. And then all of a sudden it clicks with her. Man, I'm going to play an important part in history. I'm going to play an important part in making these prophecies come true. That's exactly the way it works now. She doubted, she questioned, she used her reason just as we must today if we're going to have faith. We read all these stories in the Bible and we know what God can do, but do we have the faith that he can do them? And oftentimes we do not. We want to be in control. We want to be in control of what society says about us. We want to be in control about the perception uh, of what how society is going to perceive us. But Mary set all that aside. Joseph set all that aside. Do you not think for a moment that they knew what society was going to say? They had seen it all before. You know, I'm sure Mary wasn't the first one uh, that got pregnant before she got married in her society. I'm sure there were others. And she saw how the people in the community, she saw the relationship between the families, how people reacted. And I'm sure she was probably just a little bit fearful that that same thing would happen in her family. But she had an excuse. She had a reason. She had an angel of, of, of the Lord appear to her and tell her what was going to happen. So she was going to have a pretty solid answer for anyone that came calling. And for anyone that had heard scripture and for anyone that believed in prophecy, this was all going to make sense to them. Now they probably felt a little, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if they were, were amazed or if they were jealous that Mary was chosen for such a role, but everything fell into place. Everything that the Bible and the prophets foretold fell into place. So this is a believable story that Mary's telling, and she had the faith to believe it. Now it was up to the others that she was telling this story to have faith enough in her, to have trust enough in her to that the story that she was telling them was true. But earlier in the chapter, in, in Luke chapter one, it tells about the story of where the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah in the Holy of Holies. And the angel said that even though Zechariah and his wife were old, they were gonna have a son. And Zechariah is very doubtful. In response, the angel says that he's not gonna be able to speak until his son, John, is born. However, when Mary expresses doubts, and I don't know that it was so much a doubt as it was just a question, there's no hint from the angel of disapproval. What's the difference? Well, in many circles, skepticism and doubt are considered an absolute good. But on the other hand, in a lot of conservative and traditional religious circus, circles, any and all questions or doubting is thought to be bad. If you're in a church youth group and you have questions about the Bible, the youth leader may say to you, you shouldn't doubt, you need to have faith. And I don't know that Mary doubted when she asked the question, she just wanted to know how. Because in all her years of living, she had never heard of a virgin with child. She had never heard that. The only place she had heard that is by reading from the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, where they had foretold the virgin birth. Some doubts seek answers, and some doubts is a defense against the possibility of answers. There are people like Mary who are open to the truth, 
and they're willing to relinquish sovereignty over their lives if they can be shown that the truth is other than what they thought. And there are those like Zechariah who use those doubts as a way of staying in control of their lives and keeping their minds closed. Because think about Zechariah's situation. He and Elizabeth are both very old when they're told that they're going to have a child. All these years of barrenness, all these years of trying to have a child, and they've been unsuccessful. So they've been through this before. They know what's going on. And what are Zechariah's, what's Zechariah thinking? You know, hey, man, I really like my situation right now. Even though we wanted a child long ago, we gave up on that. And we're really happy with the way that our lives are. Are you, are you sure we're fit to be parents at this age? Are you sure we're young enough to raise a child? You know, I, I'm pretty happy with my, my, my position in Temple. Uh, we're, we're just content just living our lives without any responsibility. Uh, but that's not what God had in mind. He needed someone to pave the way for God, and he chose Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah was a faithful um, steward there at the temple, and, uh, and I'm sure God had his reasons for choosing them. You know, even when uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah and told him that his name would be John, he never got a chance to tell Elizabeth what his name would be. So when the baby was born and, and they're all sitting around, everybody, all the family is sitting around, well, what are you going to name the child? And Elizabeth spouts off with John. And it wasn't a family name. It wasn't one that they expected. And, you know, and they're like standing around, why are you going to call him John? Let's ask Zachariah. Well, Zachariah hadn't spoken since the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And then all of a sudden, when Zachariah is allowed to speak, the first thing he says is the baby's name shall be John. And what a, you know, what an affirmation uh, that, uh, of, of his wife there because the angel knew, uh, angel told Zechariah what the name of the baby was going to be. And I don't, I'm not really sure how Elizabeth knew, but I'm sure there was some kind of tugging at her heart that her son was to be called John. And then Zechariah confirms that. So there was no doubt that what the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah and said after Zechariah was struck silent for all those months during Elizabeth's pregnancy, I'm sure that he was just itching to speak because now he believed. And I'm sure he was elated uh, that, that Elizabeth got, got pregnant and Elizabeth got to bear the child John the Baptist. But Elizabeth and Mary suffered the same disappointment as both their sons were killed young. Uh, you know, they, they both died very, very young. The, the moms outlived the sons, and I'm sure that was a very hard thing for both of them to live through. But they were willing, they were able to take part in an important part of history, an important part of the Bible. It's because they were submissive to God. They had faith. There's a difference between children who have been raised in the Christian faith and those without any such background. Christianity may have never been unfamiliar to you, but if you've ever stood and looked at the gospel and found it ridiculous, impossible, inconceivable, I don't think you've really understood it. Mary may find this revelation from the angel hard to believe, but nevertheless, her reaction is measured. She doesn't stop the conversation. She asks for more information. Because she's heard this all her life. She knows it's fixing to happen. So all this is coming back to her. And then she realized just how privileged she is. She realized just what an important part of history that she's going to play. But it took her a moment to come to that realization. Well, the same is true with us. Oftentimes I wonder if we really understand how big an impact on history or society we're going to play, or do we just want to go through the motions in life and, and, uh, and, and not have a very big impact? We, wanna, we, wanna, uh, we don't want to surrender to God's will. We want to continue to pursue our own will. And how selfish would it have been for Mary if she had said, no, I really don't want to do that. That's not what I want to do. 
That's not how I want to appear in my community. That's not really what my parents had planned for me. That's really not what Joseph and I had planned. But she set all those fears aside. She set all of her desires aside and she submitted to God's will. And oh, what a miraculous thing happened when she did that. And I'm thankful for Mary because I don't know, and I'm thankful for Joseph too, because I don't know if I could have made the same decision in the same situation. Because I wanted things for Christina and I, when we got married, there are certain things that I wanted. And certainly one of those not on the top of the list was her being pregnant. I, I didn't want that. Didn't want that at all. So we took steps to avoid that. We abstained because we didn't want anything getting in the way of that. And Joseph and Mary were the same way. But they realized with this pregnancy coming on, people in the community may think differently. They may cast a different light on Mary and Joseph. How do we move from, in, in Mary's situation, how can this be? to I'm your Lord's servant. Because it seems like it's a very short step for Mary because once the pregnancy was explained, she was on board just like that. Are we that willing? Or do we mull over things for days, weeks, or maybe even months on end trying to ignore the calling that God has on our lives? Mary didn't ignore the calling. Once the situation was explained to her, she was good with it, and she was ready to roll. Do with me what you will. I am the Lord's servant. And as we read the rest of the chapter, it's only when Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist, that it all comes together for her. Because Elizabeth, by the power of the Holy Spirit, perceives that Mary carries the messianic child, and the knowledge is insight of Elizabeth confirmed what the angel said because when, her, when Mary first spoke to Elizabeth, the baby inside her womb leapt with joy. And she said, who am I that the father of the Lord Jesus Christ or the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ would come and visit me? She burst into praise and she says, my soul glorifies my spirit rejoices. She also connects all that is happening to her to the promise of the Bible over the centuries. Don't forget, Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband, is a priest. He's read these scriptures. He knows what they mean, and so does Elizabeth. She's familiar with the Bible. She's familiar with God's word. She understands what part in history she's fixing to play. Now she's not merely submitting her will but she's given it joyfully. In the end, faith always moved beyond mental ascent, and duty will involve the whole self, mind, will, and emotions. And it's just in this meeting when Mary and Elizabeth finally get it. They finally understand what they're giving up here on earth to accomplish in heaven. And it's a wonderful thing that they rejoice and that they surrendered uh, their own fears, and they submitted to God's will. We're, we are incapable on our own of simply believing in Jesus. Over the years, we've never met anyone who came to faith by simply, simply deciding to develop play, faith and carry out their plan. God has to open our hearts and to help us break through our prejudices and denials. One of the marks of real Christian faith is a sense or some kind of power outside of you putting its finger on you, coming to you, and dealing with you. We talk about Mary and Elizabeth this morning being familiar with the scriptures and knowing what they say. Well, how many children are being brought to church today to hear the word of God? How many? We don't see many young people in our Methodist church here in New Boston, Texas. A lot of parents, young parents are doing other things. They don't think it's a priority. I was talking to a gentleman last night who, uh, whose son has a three-year-old son, and he's kind of disappointed in his son because they don't regularly go to church. They don't regularly introduce their child to the Bible and the scriptures and, and what it says. 
So he's fearful that his grandchild will go up, grow up not hearing the word of God. And that's not how Elizabeth and Mary came to know the word. They were around people that read the scripture. They were around scripture all their lives because Elizabeth and Mary were women. women. They were not allowed to read the scripture back then. But how are we as parents today passing this on to our children? We don't pass it on by osmosis. <laughs> we, we can't do that. We've got to have them around the word, both the, the reading of the word and the hearing of the word. And that only happens in church. It doesn't happen too many times in the town square. It doesn't happen uh, at a football game, at a bass fishing tournament, at a baseball game, at a soccer game, at, at a college or a high school graduation. That's not where you hear the word of God. You hear the word of God in church. And at the wedding last night, Coach Buddy Ray, well, he was a former coach. He's a, he's a pastor now with the Church of Christ. Christ. I recognized a lot of the scripture that he was saying. Why did I realize that? Well, because I've been to church. I've been to Sunday school. I've been to enough weddings. I've been to enough funerals to know when, when uh, talk comes from the Bible, I recognize scripture. And he used a lot of it last night in the ceremony. And with today's day and age, when very, very few people, very few couples get married in the church, it's not often that you hear the word of God preached at an outdoor venue or at a justice of the peace or something like that. It's not very often that people, when they write their own, uh, write their own marriage vows, that they'll refer to Christ, that they'll refer to the covenant of the marriage, they'll refer to the commitment, they'll refer to what Christ had designed for his church. They don't often refer to that because they really don't want God involved a whole lot. They don't want to sound preachy or they don't want it to have too much scripture in there. And there's no such thing as too much scripture. I go back to these parents. They don't think it's important for their kids to learn. And it was vital to Mary and Elizabeth that they learned that, to learn what part in history they were going to play. And they were honored and submissive to do so. They were willing and they were able to play a part. They set aside their own wants, needs, and desires and reputation to pave the way for Jesus Christ to come into the world. What do we learn about Jesus from this passage? Well, the angel's message with, begins with revealing the virgin birth in the name of the child. You shall call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the most high. His purpose, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. This child will be the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant promises and the Old Testament promises of the earthly kingdom for the nation of Israel. He's going to fulfill every one of these scriptures. And that's what the angel of the Lord is telling Mary, and she is satisfied with that answer. She's elated with that message because that means all these prophecies are fixing to come true in her time. And what a blessing is that? Because here we were born 2,000 years Later, and even though we weren't born around this time, we hear the good news. Now, there will be other times when we're talking to our children and grandchildren, and we can tell them about important parts in our society that we grew up in, milestone events that happened. But Mary and Joseph, they have the story of a lifetime. <laughs> Man, what a great story that they got to sit around and tell the town, their their, their relatives, their, their children, their parents, their grandparents. What a story they got to tell. What did obedience cost Mary? This girl, no more than 15, near the bottom of the social ladder, knew that if she surrendered to God, she would go even, even lower. Yet she did so willingly. She went through the agony of watching her son be tortured and die young. Think of all the darkness that she embraced when she said, I'm the Lord's servant. But today, most people in the world, they know who Mary is. 
Because she humbled herself and became a servant, she became one of the greatest people in history. This vividly illustrates those that who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Mary is saying to the angel, I'm only a poor, uneducated girl, and I will be a social outcast if you bring this child into my life. How is that supposed to save the world? And the angel's answer is literally, with nothing, or with God, nothing is impossible. No word from God will ever fail. So surrender to him. And don't underestimate what he can do in and through you if you put yourself in his hands like Mary and Elizabeth did. As Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, if we give ourselves wholly to him, he will do great things even in our troubles. So how much of the future does uh, Mary understand in Luke 1? Because this is kind of just the onset. I'm, there's a lot of things that have happened in my life that I look back on and I go, boy, I wish I'd asked more questions when that, when that came along. Man, I wish I'd have been more prepared. But Mary's, uh, Mary's response is simple acceptance. I'm the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. She is not saying, man, it's so clear now I get it, nor I love this plan, and I'm excited to be part of it. She is saying, it doesn't all make sense to me, but I will pursue I will follow. And this can be a very important space to occupy, at least for a time. Because some people will make no move toward Jesus at all, unless everything makes sense to them. Rationally, emotionally, personally. For them, it's either joy in God or nothing at all. But sometimes you can only do what Mary does, just submit. And trust the fears and trust despite the fears and revelations. That gives you a foothold for moving forward. And can we? Can you imagine where we would be today if Mary had just said, I'm, I'm not going to do this until I understand everything. She probably understood very little. Elizabeth and Zechariah probably understood very little. If they had understood everything that they were going to embrace, because at the time, that the angel of the Lord to them appeared to them. They only told them a few things. You know, you're gonna you're gonna uh, bear a son. He's gonna be called John. He's gonna pave the way for the Savior. He's not gonna drink any fermented fermented drink. Uh, you know, he's only gonna eat this. I mean, there were a lot of things that they said. And Zachariah and Elizabeth said, oh, "Well, we can probably live with that. You know, we don't ever have to worry about him being drunk at a keg party." Uh, we don't ever have to worry about him drinking anything like that because the angel of the Lord has already said that he'll never drink fermented drink. So they already knew a few things about him, but they probably didn't tell him the story about King Herod and Herodias and how he would come to his end. They probably didn't tell him about the persecutions that he would endure. They probably didn't tell him about everything that he would do out in the wilderness now, if they were going through a highlight reel, they would probably say, hey, son, but look, look, you'll get to baptize Jesus in the Jordan River. You will be around for that. You will get to see God open up the skies. You will get to see the dove descend on Jesus like the, uh, in the form of the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove. And you will hear the words from God, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. You will get to hear all that. It'll be a pretty good time. I'm sure that the angel of the Lord didn't explain everything that was going to happen to their son, John. Otherwise, they not, might not have been as willing to, to take him on. But God doesn't always do that in our lives either. He doesn't always fully explain the situation to us. Because if we knew everything that was going to happen, the good, the bad, and the ugly, would we still be willing to submit? And the answer is probably not. But Mary experienced enough joy. Joseph experienced enough joy. And, uh, and he was satisfied with their lot in history that they were willing to do that. They were willing to submit. They were willing to overcome their fears and do what God was asking them to do. 
Our greatest motive for for surrendering to him cannot be, what will he do for us? It must be love for him, for what he did for us. That was, that is our motivation. That is our motivation to do things for him, is what he did for us. Mary never asked, what's in it for me? She just only wanted to know how it was going to happen. But too many times I think that we ask the question, well, if I surrender to God's will, if I start preaching the gospel, if I take on this Sunday school class, if I give to this charitable organization, if I spend more time in my Bible, what's that going to cost me? What's that going to cost me? If I take a stand for God's word, what's going to be the outcome? What's going to be the consequence of that? With my family, with my business, with my standing in society, What will I lose or what will I stand to gain? Mary was not called for an easy task and we may not be either because Mary would be misunderstood and she would endure much personal sorrow through her life. So if the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ would be misunderstood and would endure much personal sorrow, can we expect anything less? No, no we're probably going to be misunderstood from time to time. And we're probably going to endure a little bit of sorrow from time to time. But in the end, it was worth it for Mary. In the end, it was worth it for Zachariah and Elizabeth. And in the end, it was worth it for Joseph to do what he did, to not abandon his wife, to not divorce her quietly, to stick around through the hard times despite all the ridicule coming from his family and his Nazarene community. Mary demonstrated a great reverence for God. When Gabriel appeared, she did not seem stunned by the reality of angelic beings. Rather, she seems to be trying to figure out why would God send an angel to me? Her reverence for God made her a joyful woman and God chooses and uses persons who fear him. Her firm grasp of scripture and its grip on her set Mary apart from most of the others. Her character, her worldview, her understanding of history and future events, they were all shaped by God's word. She believed God's word was true and she saw her own experience as fulfillment of these divine promises. God chooses and uses persons who who love and live his word. Surely Mary had more questions to ask, especially about her pregnancy would affect her relationship with Joseph, her family, and the Nazarene community. And others might have chosen to argue or demand assurances, but not Mary. Her life was lived for God under God's word, and she unhesitatingly agreed to serve God's purpose. God chooses and uses persons with a submissive spirit. As we read the story of Mary this morning, we need to take a page out of her playbook and set our fears aside and replace that fear with submission. God, if you're going to use me, go ahead. I'm ready, I'm willing, and I'm able. And I know you can do great things if I submit to you just like Mary did. And so let's move forward. I know there may be a little heartache and a little bit of trouble that comes along, but that's okay. In the end, it will be worth it. And what a great story about Mary's faith that she only wanted to know the how before she willingly submitted to God's will. And my prayer for you during this Christmas season is that you can look at your life in the same way, that you can think back to Mary's life at the announcement that she was going to give birth to the, to the Savior, to the King of the Jews, and realize, wow, this is going to be a pretty big thing for me, regardless of how people in society or uh, what I'm going to be perceived like in my own hometown. And if you're looking for a place to worship this morning, uh, Tap Methodist Church will be open from uh, 11, 1130, or excuse me, 1030 to noon for worship service and 915 to 1015 for Sunday school. We're located at 715 South McCoy Boulevard in New Boston, Texas. 
and we'd love to have you with us and join us. Join us next week for lesson number five.